and the color, as I said, is reddish brown in color, and uh, and this would signify that she had blood pressure when she sustained this injury. Doctor, how long, if you can offer an opinion, must Nicole Brown Simpson have lived in order for that coloration to have shown and be seen at autopsy? Uh, you can get this kind of hemorrhage into the soft tissues within minutes after the injury. And when you say within minutes, how many minutes? You can get it as early as a minute because when you crush the tissues, the tissues bleed and you can get the bleeding immediately. In your opinion, could Nicole Brown Simpson have died as little as one minute after this injury was inflicted? Well, that's always a possibility, but uh, it could be also a few minutes later. <laughs> could Nicole Brown Simpson have received the sharp force injury that you identified as the last major sharp force injury inflicted, that fatal neck wound, received that within seconds of having received the blunt force trauma injury shown in this photo? Yes and then lived for the period of time necessary, as you've indicated, to allow the discoloration? No, not seconds, because you need to have enough blood pressure to cause this bruising. I, I misheard your question. It's, it, the injury to the neck, which caused the fatal wound, must have occurred after a few minutes or a minute later, because you need some time for the bleeding to occur in the tissues. And for, for that reason, I would say that she was alive at least for a few minutes, at least a minute if not more, before the last wound was inflicted because once the last wound is inflicted, you won't have any blood pressure available to cause this kind of bleeding in the scalp. Doctor, do you have an opinion as to any source or sources that could cause that blunt force trauma contusion? Uh, it could be uh, a something like a fist, it could be an object with a round smooth surface, like the base of a knife, could do that. Uh, you could also have the head being struck against a smooth surfaced area, which is rounded. And doctor, what if any physiological or body reaction would you expect from Nicole Brown Simpson having sustained that injury? Uh, the injury itself is not fatal, but as you know, the, this is a covering of the head, the skin, of the covering of the head, and you have the brain inside. And as you know that you can have what's called the concussion happening, uh, which is uh, transient loss of consciousness can occur. If somebody sustains a bruising to the head, it can occur. And what is the effect if a concussion occurs? Uh, you can become unconscious uh, for uh, some time. Uh, for what kind of time period? It, the concussion syndrome can occur for a few uh, seconds to minutes, and uh, uh, you may not find any structural abnormality in the brain. I'm sorry, you may not find any structural abnormality of the brain at autopsy? Yes. So in other words, a concussion can be sustained from this blunt force trauma, and you as a forensic pathologist at autopsy can't see something which confirms that that occurred? That's correct. And this is uh, commonly seen in boxers, uh, boxing, when people get hit with a fist, they transiently get dazed. And or even longer. Transiently meaning? Seconds. And then uh, sometimes it can be even for minutes. And that's why you're seeing the countdown and then they get up. And people have done studies and they found that you don't find anything on CT scans or MRI scans in them. So okay, I just wanted before, to. Before you run ahead, CT scans are CAT scans? Yes. And what's that a fancy term for? It's basically a computerized tomography of the computerized axial tomography of the head, which yeah, is taking can multiple... Can we get it down to a lower level for me? Is it an ex a fancy x-ray? It's a fancy x-ray giving three-dimensional views. All right, and the other one you were talking about was an MRI? Yeah. What's an MRI? It's a magnetic resonance imaging. And what's that a fancy device? <clears throat> That's another way of uh, looking at the brain structures when somebody is alive. All right, and what, what do you want to say about those with respect well, what to... What I'm trying to say is that you can have the syndrome of concussion without leaving any findings at autopsy. 
and you can have the syndrome of concussion when somebody is alive without leaving any brain damage. The doctor, assume hypothetically that uh, Nicole Brown Simpson was struck on the head, either with a hand, fist, or the rounded end of a knife in the manner you described, and became dazed, as you've indicated, and slumped to the ground. And the perpetrator then moved from where her body was over to where Mr. Goldman's body is found, to that area, and then came back to Nicole Brown Simpson and raised her head in the manner you described yesterday and inflicted that major incised stab wound as you demonstrated yesterday. Would that circumstance be consistent with the time frame required to create the bruising coloration in the scalp as seen in B20? Objection calls for speculation and proper hypothetical not based on any facts in this case. Oh, well. You may answer the question, doctor. Uh, but I also want to ask in your hypothetical situation regarding the stab wounds of the neck and the other wounds she had on the head. All right, what do you want to ask? want to know whether they were also there when this bruising occurred. Let's assume they weren't there. Then, uh, to answer your hypothetical question, that is a possibility. And let's assume they were there. Then, uh, uh, also it's a possibility, but that means the stab wounds to the neck and the other sharp force injuries to the head must have occurred uh, around the time of the bruising but before the final wound in the neck. And on what basis do you draw that uh, distinction? Because my opinion is that the major wound to the neck is the final wound. And the stab wounds to the left side of the neck uh, have hemorrhage in the deep tissues, which indicated that she had blood pressure when those wounds were inflicted. And we also, uh, and they would also cause bleeding. We also have evidence of injuries to the other sharp force injuries to the left side uh, and back side of the head, in addition to this bruising on the right side of the head, which all have evidence of bleeding in the tissues, which indicates that she had blood pressure when those injuries were inflicted. So, and I already opined that the last wound was the uh, fatal incised wound to the neck. So that is why I'm saying that I wanted to know in your hypothetical whether these wounds are also were there and the bruising to the right side of the head took place. And if they were, they would result in a lowered blood pressure, is that correct? They would cause uh, uh, lowering of the uh, blood pressure, but what I'm saying is they could have occurred concurrently while the uh, infliction of the stab wounds took place during the altercation. The person could also have been pushed or hit on the right side of the head simultaneously while the uh, uh, stab wounds are taking place. And still produce the discoloration that you've seen in this photograph B20? Yes. And still subsequently then produce the major stab incised wound as the last sharp force injury received? Yes. What I'm trying to say is you have the sharp force injuries to the left neck, you have sharp force injuries to the uh, side and back of the head, you have a blunt force injury to the right side of the head. Come, uh, I can't say how they occurred in sequence, but they occurred before the fatal stab wound, and since I already opined that the fatal stab wound occurred when the person was incapacitated and probably unconscious, uh, face down, combined these injuries somehow resulted in her being unconscious. Some, I'm sorry, resulted in her being unconscious. unconscious. With, Doctor, blood, um, with blood pressure. With blood pressure. Yes. Doctor, in your opinion, given that set of circumstances, could all of those other injuries have been inflicted in a very short period of time? Yes. How short a period of time in your opinion? Within minutes, the altercation can take place so fast because you only are talking about three sharp force traumas to the head and four sharp force trauma to the left side of the neck and this blunt force trauma, they could occur at a very rapid sequence. When you say within minutes, do you mean multiple minutes or are you using that Few term minutes. locally? Few minutes or even less than that, much less than that. How much less? within a minute also, because this kind of altercations can take place pretty rapidly. And does the period for the altercation to some degree depend upon the relative physical size and strength between the perpetrator and the victim? Yes. Does it also depend on whether or not the victim is taken by surprise or is aware of impending danger? Yes. 
Does it also depend upon how motivated the perpetrator may be in inflicting injury? Yes. Does it also depend on whether the, mo the perpetrator has the element of surprise on his or her side? Yes. And from the standpoint of the forensic pathology, is there any way medically on that basis alone that you can draw conclusions to reasonable medical certainty as to how these occurred? No. <clears throat> May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, did Dr. Golden address the contusion that is seen in this photograph, B20, in his original protocol? Yes, he did. Did he also diagram it? Yes, he did. Now, Doctor, um, let me move. We'll come back to this photograph and we'll come back to the diagrams and the chart uh, protocols in a moment. But I'd like to move to the uh, photograph that is immediately to the right on this Exhibit 352 of photograph B20 what has a marking of B33 brain tissue sample. Do you see that, Doctor? Yes. Are you familiar with that particular sample that is shown in that photograph? Yes, I am. What is that? That is a sample of the brain of Ms. Simpson, which was saved by, our, by Dr. Golden during his autopsy, uh, which, Dr., which I saw when I reviewed the tissue samples with the defense pathologist, Dr. Barden, and Dr. Wolf was also present at the time. And that was on June 22nd of 1994? Yes. Now, you indicated that Dr. Golden saved this section of brain tissue, is that correct? Yes. And it was saved in one of those jars that uh, you showed us yesterday from the photographs? Yes, the formalin-containing jar. Was there more than this <clears throat> one sample of brain tissue saved by Dr. Golden from the autopsy of Nicole Brown Simpson? There were several samples saved. Approximately how many samples were saved? And if you need to refresh your memory with something, please do so. I have to refresh my memory. All I right, think while he's refreshing his memory, Ms. Clark, could you... Uh... Yes, what do you need, Doctor? I thought it was Ms. Ford again. In addition to this uh, specimen, which had the contusion, there were 13 sections of brain and brainstem of varying sizes. That were preserved from the autopsy of Nicole Brown Simpson by Dr. Golden? Yes. So if we include this section, we would have 14? Yes. <clears throat> and doctor, did you examine each of the 14 sections grossly, that is, without the aid of a magnifying device or a microscope? Yes, I did. On June 22nd? Yes, I did. At the same time that doctors Baden and Wolf were with you to do so if they so desired? Yes. When you did this, did you observe anything of significance to you in looking at the brain tissue that is shown in the photograph that is B33? There was evidence of hemorrhage on the uh, surface of the brain, which we refer to in medical terms subarachnoid hemorrhage. S-U-B-A-R-A-C-H-N-O-I-D, hemorrhage, and underlying the hemorrhage on the surface, because it was a section of the brain, there was evidence of discoloration of the gray portion of the cerebral cortex, and this was a contusion of the brain, and it measured 10 millimeters by 4 millimeters when we examined it on June 22nd, 1994. Doctor, when that examination took place, did either Dr. Baden or Dr. Wolf tell you anything regarding what, if any, observation they made of that tissue? We were together, and I, uh, and myself and Dr. Baden felt that this was the brain contusion. Did you identify that without hearing 
from Dr. Baden as, any, as to any view he might have. Absolutely. And as to any view Dr. Wolf might have. Absolutely. We're basically the three of you independently looking at this uh, series of tissue samples. Yes. And when but you... Independently looking at it, but collectively, it is one sample there. Independently looking as your three individuals, but yes. you're all looking at the same thing. Yes. All right. Now, Doctor, how long did it take you in looking at that sample to think that there is something of significance to you as a forensic pathologist shown in that sample? Immediately, you could realize there was a pathology there. Uh, why can you do that immediately as a forensic pathologist? Because if you look at the photograph here, you see the normal uh, gray-brown cortex, and you see the white matter underlying that, and that's a normal appearance. And it's obvious that this part of the brain is discolored and hemorrhagic, that is, there's bleeding into this part of the brain, and that's how a contusion looks. And doctor, when you use the term contusion with this brain tissue, are you using it in the same terms that you have used it with respect to the photograph B20? Yes, it's a bruising of the brain. And as you've described in general with blunt force trauma, that is of a contusion nature. Yes. Doctor, from your examination, and by the way, have you microscopically examined uh, this <coughs> tissue sample? Yes. And what, if any, significant findings did you make from that observation? It was an acute, acute means fresh contusion of the brain with hemorrhage. What, does, uh, the, what is the significance, if any, of the finding that it is an acute hemorrhage? It could occur as a, it occurred immediately after the injury, but it can be observable as early as a minute. A minute after the injury was inflicted? Yes. So if the person lived a minute with blood pressure, that the injury could uh, get to a condition where it could be seen as it is in this photograph? Yes. And then the person could be dead? That's I'm, correct. I'm not saying from this injury, but... Is this injury, in your opinion, a fatal injury? No. Why not? Because it's a single contusion to the brain, but it is a mark of an injury. What does that mean? That is, you could have this injury as, uh, as part of the head injury which Ms. Simpson sustained when the contusion to the brain was, contusion to the scalp, skin was sustained on the right side of the head. And uh, by itself, as a marker, by itself, you can't call it a fatal injury because it's only a small portion of the brain which is injured. But it could be part, this could be associated with a concussion syndrome, number one. It could cause seizures sometimes, but by itself, you cannot say it can cause death like you can say with a stab wound or a sharp force injury. In order to gain context for that injury, what are you going to have to look for? We need to know which, which side it was from, and Dr. Golden's report indicates that it was from the right side underlying the contusion, I mean, underlying the contusion of the skin. We're going to get into that in a moment in more detail. But first, when a contusion to the brain is observed at autopsy, would it be the custom and practice in your office to retain that sample of brain tissue? Yes. In retaining that sample of brain tissue, would the forensic pathologist be expected to cut it in a fashion so that the entire area of the contusion is preserved? Yes. From your observation on June 22nd, your observation of this photograph, and your microscopic examination, or let me finish the question, please, doctor. From your examination uh, microscopically, can you determine whether all of the contusion in this area of Nicole Brown Simpson's brain was excised at autopsy? Uh, the photograph we took was uh, on the 30th. <clears throat> the ma margins of the area we saw of the brain cortex did show hemorrhage in the margin, so I can't say with certainty whether the contusion which was uh, seen was the extent of the contusion or was there was any residual contusion which was left in the uh, brain when this portion was resected. For a little more clarity, uh, at least for me, um, is this photograph B33 
a fair and accurate representation of the tissue as you saw it with Dr. Baden and Dr. Wolf on June 22nd. This photograph was taken on June 30th. It I, is understand, not I understand that. My question, though, is irrespective of the difference in dates, is the photograph a fair and accurate representation of the tissue as you saw it on the 22nd? Uh, uh, no, because we took a section for microscopic study, so the photograph we have reflects the injury, but I cannot say with certainty that it reflects the state of the contusion we saw it on the 22nd, because we didn't take photographs on the 22nd. You did not take photographs on the 22nd. That's correct. But did you, on or after the 22nd and before the 30th, take a sample of that tissue in order to prepare one or more microscopic slides. It was done on the 30th. All right, and that was done before this photograph was taken? A section was taken and this contusion uh, was photographed at the same time. What well, was the photograph taken? Uh, I mean, we don't see anything in the form of a cutting device in this photograph. No, so but if we have additional photographs which show the section we photographed also. All right, do you have a photograph which shows the section before any cutting for microscopic uh, examination was performed. I have to see my photograph whether we have additional photographs. Um, can we have a moment for the doctor to do that, doc uh, Your Honor? Go ahead. Doctor, go ahead. Although at this point, we might as well take a break. Well, look, I'll, I'll get a few more minutes in. Doctor, why don't you come back here? We can talk some more, and then you'll have a chance to uh, look for it over the noon hour. Doctor, the kind of brain tissue that is represented in photograph B33 is what kind? It's the cerebral cortex. What is the cerebral cortex? It is the outer surface of the brain. And is it localized in certain areas of the brain? It's uh, mainly on the surface of the brain and all the lobes of the brain. You have the same appearance uh, of the uh, grossly of the brain tissue. Did you examine this tissue sample to try and determine with greater specificity what part of the brain it could have come from? Yes, I, I did a microscopic study. I examined the microscopic sections which were submitted. And microscopically, there was evidence of the internal uh, granular layer. The brain cortex has several layers. And there's an internal granular layer present which would uh, uh, go along with it being from the parietal or temporal lobe of the brain. Would you show us, please, turning, this is from, uh, can, well, let me start this way. Can you determine from examination of the tissue sample what side of the brain, right or left side, parietal temporal area, that tissue comes from? You cannot tell the side. Can you tell it in any fashion by either gross examination or microscopic examination? Not from a small sample like this, you cannot tell. But microscopically, you, can, uh, you cannot tell the side either. Would you now, let's assume for just the sake of argument, it's the right side. Would you turn to the right side for the jury to view and point out the area or areas from which this tissue sample would be consistent? From this parietal area or temporal area. Actually, I'm showing the outside of the head. The brain has got a specific structure on the inside. It's just a rough uh, demonstration of the anatomical location in the brain. Well, the parietal area here and temporal area here. Uh, Your Honor, uh, for the record, uh, Dr. Lakshman, turning to face the jury with profile to the right side, has circled uh, with his finger the area just immediately uh, in front of and slightly above the right top of the ear as the temporal area, is that correct, doctor? Yes. And the parietal area you circled, if you could do that one more time, was an area that's directly above the first area that I just described and circles a, a larger uh, area of the, uh, starting to get to the top of the head. Yes. And doctor, uh, obviously there's no way that you can show us with your brain because it's, I assume, safely encased within your skull. At this, at this time, yes. At this time. We'll try and keep in that condition. Can I have one moment, Your Honor, with one diagram? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, 
this is going to be board 5B for set uh, 349. And if Mr. Lynch, while counsel and the doctors are moving, could flip to a form 29. Doctor, this form 29, is this the form that uh, was available for Dr. Golden during the course of the autopsy of Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. And does this, uh, in schematic form, show the brain? Yes. Can you show us on this form these areas that could be the areas from which the sample of brain tissue seen in photograph B33 originated? Yes. Uh, for that, I've discussed uh, briefly the anatomic uh, uh, description here. Your Honor, will you give me a few more minutes? Yes. Doctor, we'll do so then. Uh, this is the side view of the brain. This is the what we call as the cerebrum, C-E-R-E-B-R-U-M. And this is a, a portion of the brain called the cerebellum, C-E-R-E-B-E-L-L-U-M. And you have the smaller structure here, which is the brain stem. Uh, the anatomical region, parietal, temporal lobes, which we were discussing, refers to this part of the cerebrum. The front, there is a, the brain, as you know, has convolutions on the surface, and it is di basically divided into a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. So the parietal lobe is somewhere this area, and the temporal lobe is this area of the brain. Doctor, and before you go further, just briefly, so I can mark in where you, I'm going to put F for frontal, P for parietal, P for parietal, T for temporal, and, and O for occipital yes. on the lower right hand schematic. Yes. So this is what I referred to when I said parietal temporal area, and this is what I referred to when I said that microscopically there was internal granular layer present on the layers of the cortex, because the layers of the cortex have six layers. The frontal lobe of the brain usually doesn't have the granular layer and uh, it's usually a granular cortex, so that's how I can say it's from the parietal temporal area. The occipital lobe has different types of, uh, it has also some different layers, but they are different appearing. So just microscopically, I could favor that this being from the parietal temporal area. And doctor, is this schematic showing the right side of the brain? Yes. And is the diagram directly above it, the reverse showing the left side of the brain? Yes, and this diagram shows the top part of the brain as you're looking at the brain from the above and this is the lower part of the brain showing the brain when you're looking at it from the bottom the brain is turned upside down and to you have the cerebellum here brain stem here and this is the rest of the uh, brain and this part of the brain is the uh, uh, under surface of the frontal portion of the brain the F part this is the under surface of the temporal lobe which is the T here. Your Honor, during the recess, I'll mark uh, what has been right. done and ask that it be reflected on the record at the afternoon uh, start of the trial. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the morning session. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Do not conduct any deliberations amongst yourselves until the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 1 o'clock. The defendants again present before the court. All parties are present. Mr. Cochran. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would uh, like to bring a matter to your attention. Uh, it's been brought to my attention that um, from calling my office and from talking to a number of people that the camera 
has apparently been pretty much fixated on Mr. Simpson uh, during these proceedings, and uh, that's apparently uh, different than what normally happens here. And, and I'm concerned about that. I think it's unfair. This is a very emotional time for him. To have the camera on him every second is, is, is just quite unfair. I'm not sure what the court can do about it, but I would certainly appeal to the um, uh, good judgment and the sense of fairness of those who operate the camera to uh, use the camera as you normally use it and put it on the lawyer and the witness as opposed to fixating on Mr. Mr. Simpson, Your Honor. Well, we have one practical difficulty in that I've directed them not to photograph or video <coughs> any of the uh, victims in the matter. So that limits their ability to move around, especially when Mr. Kalberg is working with any of the, uh, with chart 352 and the other charts that, that contain crime scene photos. So I, I understand your position and we'll have to ch trust the uh, good taste and judgment of the uh, directors upstairs for Court TV. Thank you. Please do that. Thank you. All right. Mr. Kalberg, any other comment? No, Your Honor. All right. I might add that I found distracting the contortions of some members of the audience. And if it continues to be distracting, those persons will be uh, asked to leave the courtroom. Also, people appear to have forgotten about the no gum chewing or eating in the courtroom. And I have six people on videotape from this morning's session that are going to be excluded from all further sessions. All right, let's proceed. Let's have the jury. Dr. Lakshman, would you resume the witness stand, please? All right, good afternoon again, doctor. Good afternoon. You reminded, sir, you were still under oath, and Mr. Kelberg, you may continue with your direct examination. Thank you, yes. Your Honor. I'm glad Dr. Lakshman agrees that I may continue with my direct. Good. Doctor, over the lunch hour, and perhaps you can uh, step to the board, do we have an opportunity to complete uh, a generalized description of the areas of the brain on this Form 29 from the uh, big uh, blow-up that is a part of our Exhibit 344, uh, 349, excuse me. Yes. And, Doctor, does, um, the, uh, does each of the entries that have been made in my um, handwriting or printing accurately reflect what is described by the entry made? Yes. And basically, does it accurately summarize what you told us this morning regarding the various structures and locations of the brain? Yes. The only th word that I did not indicate uh, anywhere is the word cerebrum. And you were talking about the cerebral cortex. That covers the entire area of the occipital, parietal, frontal, and temporal lobes as we see it on the two right side, uh, left and right side depictions of the brain? Yes, the cerebrum includes all the four lobes we alluded to. And I didn't want to write that in because I think it's getting a bit crowded uh, in that chart. There is also, I think you testified yesterday regarding the um, material, that horizontal running um, schematic um, that we have written in the word spinal cord. And does that accurately reflect what that diagram or schematic is intended to reflect? Yes. While we're up here, uh, and yesterday I asked you about one of the mistakes of Dr. Golden involving this contusion to the brain that is seen in photograph B33 of exhibit uh, 354, I believe it is. Yes. I'm sorry, 352. Yes. Now, doctor, let me circle. In fact, if I could get a blue marker. For the record, Your Honor, with the blue marker, I've outlined what appears to be two handwritten words in the middle of Form 29. Doctor, are you familiar with what's written there? Yes. Was that written by Dr. Golden? Yes. And what does that reflect? No injuries. And in the course and practice of the forensic pathologist conducting an autopsy and using this form, would you expect the doctor, having examined the brain as you expect the doctor to do so, to make an entry if, in fact, the doctor observes no injuries in the area depicted by this diagram? Yes, I mean, 
This kind of entry is made only after examining the brain. And do you interpret for your use in forming opinions from the entry of no injuries that Dr. Golden at the time of the original autopsy felt that there were no injuries observed by him in the areas of the brain depicted in these schematic drawings? That would be my conclusion. You have to keep your voice up. That please, would be my conclusion. Now, Doctor, there is also a similar entry uh, that appears at the very bottom. Uh, and, and if I might, Your Honor, for the no injuries that I just circled, I'm going to make a line and write B33 to reflect uh, the photograph that we're talking about. And then I'm also going to outline in blue at the bottom the second entry that seems to say no injuries as well. Is that correct, Doctor? Yes. And you interpret that to reflect no injuries observed with respect to what area of the body? The spinal cord. I'm sorry, keep your voice. The spinal cord. Uh, now, Doctor, you indicated yesterday, I believe, that Dr. Golden addressed this contusion in an addendum. Is that correct? Yes. And if we could ask Mr. Lynch to set up our other easel so we can put up and get the board if you'll set up the easel. And this is board 8B as in boy, Your Honor. Now, Doctor, I, I want to invite your attention to page two of the addendum uh, that has this date handwritten in of July 1, 1994. This is Dr. Golden's addendum in the case of Nicole Brown Simpson. Is that correct? Yes. Does this page, re does this page reflect uh, an entry by Dr. Golden regarding this brain contusion that you saw in the photograph B33? Yes. Would you identify it for us, please? This is item one. Uh, on June 30th, we, I, exam I was present when he examined the tissue jar again, at which point uh, we, we, I did show him the cerebral cortex with the confusion, and we took photographs, and a section was submitted uh, for microscopic examination. Now, Doctor, uh, you indicated that you observed this contusion initially when you examined the tissue in the presence of Drs. Baden and Wolf on June 22nd. Is that correct? Yes. Did you speak with Dr. Golden at some time after that observation of June 22nd, before the time that this addendum got even drafted in a rough form? Yes. When approximately did you speak to him? I don't recall the exact date, but. Uh, when I saw that there was a contusion to the brain, which he had not addressed in his original report, I brought it to his attention, at which point he was already planning to do an addendum anyway because of the other injuries which were not addressed, which were seen in the photographs. So uh, at my direction, an addendum was uh, prepared. And did you give instructions to Dr. Golden as to whether or not you expected any addendum prepared by him to include reference to this brain contusion? Yes, I did. And doctor, is this uh, part that you've just outlined uh, on page two of the addendum report um, to reflect what you were talking about when we were looking at the photograph, that is a section on July, I'm sorry, on June 30th of 1994, a section of that contused area of the brain was cut in order to provide for microscopic examination? Yes. <coughs> Uh, Your Honor, for the record, I'm going to outline in blue on page two of the addendum the material referred to by Dr. Lakshman, and I'll write again B33. Thank you. Doctor, before we leave this entry, the last line of that paragraph says, my recollection is that the above section was from the right parietotemporal region. Uh, are you familiar with how that came about? I asked him where he, uh, when, he's, when, he's, when he saw the contusion, I asked him where, where it, where it, which side was of the brain was it from and the region, and he indicated that he recollects that it was from the right parietotemporal area. And doctor, is there any way, you, you testified, I believe this morning, that there was no way from a scientific standpoint of looking at that tissue 
to distinguish whether it came from the right side from the parietal temporal area or from the left side of the parietal temporal area. Is that an accurate recitation of your morning testimony? That is correct. And short of Dr. Golden's memory being accurate, is there any way that you can confirm or refute that recollection? Uh, I can do neither. And you have to keep your voice up, please. I can Dr. do neither. Um, if we can flip uh, briefly, Mr. Lynch, on the addendum blow up. Now we're looking at a document on a Form 14 that is titled Microscopic Description, and it appears to be dated July 7, 1994. Are you familiar with this document, Doctor? Yes. What is this? This is a microscopic examination report on the examination of the contusion done by Dr. Golden. Did you direct that he do that, that is, make a microscopic examination? Yes, because uh, we, when we had the injury examined on June 30th, I discussed with him that we should do a microscopic exam, and that mm -hmm. is why a section was submitted and a report has been generated to document this injury. Did you tell him that you wanted a report generated? Yes. Did you, however, independently examine microscopically the tissue section that was removed? Yes, I did. Is your opinion as to what it shows the same or different from what Dr. Golden indicates in this Form 14 report? My conclusion is that it is an acute cerebrocortical contusion. And when you say acute in the sense that you described it earlier this morning? <coughs> yes. Now, Dr. Uh, I described the contusion of the scalp uh, and also the contusion of the brain, but I keep gave it. the timing for the scalp. All right, if you'll keep your voice up, you said you gave the timing only for the scalp contusion? Yes. All right, is there any difference in timing when you use the term acute to reflect the brain contusion rather than the scalp contusion? Well, here we have a microscopic section available. In the scalp, we did not have a microscopic section available. So this makes it easier to date an injury than just looking at it grossly. And dating, in this sense, means what when the interpretation is that it's an acute contusion to the brain? Dating means uh, you try to see the, how old the injury is since the injury was inflicted. An acute cerebrocortical contusion means that the in, the, this injury could have occurred, occurred soon after the injury. And though the bruising of the brain occurred at the time of injury, you can perceive it grossly, that is on naked eye examination, within a minute, and microscopically also, that's what it reflects. So this condition could be as early as one minute and could be several hours old also. If you'll recall my hypothetical question with respect to the perpetrator striking Nicole Brown Simpson on the scalp with either a closed fist or the rounded end of a knife and then moving to the area where Mr. Goldman was and then returning before uh, inflicting the major stab incised wound and you gave answers regarding that hypothetical set of circumstances, would your answers be the same with respect to that hypothetical as applied to the brain contusion? Yes. Now, Doctor, is it a mistake of Dr. Golden's, number one, to have not identified that brain contusion at original autopsy? Yes. And is it a mistake of Dr. Golden's to have written on Form 29 that there were no injuries to the brain given what you saw in the tissue sample seen in photograph B33. Yes. And is it a um, mistake of Dr. Golden's not to have diagrammed on Form 29 an area where this brain contusion actually was? Yes. Doctor, taking into account all of these uh, mistakes by Dr. Golden, do any or all together have any significance to you in addressing any of the issues that we asked you about and about which you have been testifying? No. Why not? Uh, because it didn't cause death. The cause of death was the sharp force injuries, uh, which I already discussed, the big wound to the neck, the four stab wounds. But it is a brain injury which uh, is important to be documented, but it didn't play a part in the cause of death. Now, Doctor, over the lunch hour, did you have an opportunity to examine your photographs 
to attempt to refresh your memory as to whether or not our B33 photograph reflects the tissue, the brain tissue sample before there was a section taken out for microscopic exam or after. It was a photograph, B33 is a photograph of the brain contusion before the microscopic section was taken. And you can see that is also indicated in the previous page. Uh, All right, the addendum, page two. Yes. Uh, incidentally, before Mr. Lynch looks at, let me write uh, in the blue on the microscopic description. I'll write B33 on that page. Paragraph 1, line 4, the initial specimen as well as the representative section was photographed. Now, if we could briefly put the photograph back up and leave the um, two schematic, or the schematic and the addendum. And we're looking again, doctor, at photograph B33 give counsel and the doctors an opportunity to position themselves. This photograph now, doctor, your independent memory is, is a picture of the whole sample. Is that correct? Yes. And I want to go back to the question or questions that I was asking this morning about when a forensic pathologist sees a brain contusion, would you expect the pathologist to excise the entire area of the brain contusion? If it is a smaller contusion, yes. But if it's a larger contusion, you describe the dimensions of the contusion, photograph it if necessary, then take a section of a portion of the contusion in conjunction with a normal piece of brain tissue so that you can study it well. Would you describe the contusion that you believe was sustained by Nicole Brown Simpson, as reflected in this sample, as a small contusion? Yes. As a result of that belief, doctor, would you have expected Dr. Golden to take out the entire section of brain tissue with the contusion in it? If he had observed it, yes. And if that had been done, would you expect to see around the margin or outside portion of the brain tissue an area of normal brain tissue so that you would know that you're seeing the entire contused area in that sample? Yes. In the photograph B33, is that in fact what you see? Uh, no, you can see the contusion coming to the margin. And as a result of that, are you able to say how much more extensive, if at all, that brain contusion was than from what you can see in the photograph <coughs> B33? I cannot say how much more it was. But if it had been significantly more, would you expect to see on the photographic review of the head area of Nicole Brown Simpson some evidence to reflect that the brain contusion had in fact been sustained? You cannot make that kind of judgment by looking at the external photographs. You need to see photographs of the brain itself in entirety to make that kind of judgment. I, I was talking about the scalp, for example. Okay. Can you look? at the photographs showing the scalp to get some idea whether any additional area of contusion was significant or not if it had not been retained at the time of autopsy in the sample taken. You can't do it from the scalp photograph. So basically, doctor, on what basis then, if any, are you able to say that that's a small contusion? Well, the, the you could see the other margins of the contusion, which is uh, which was there when I saw it, it's about a centimeter by four millimeters. A centimeter is a centimeter? Yes, that's about less than half an inch. And by four millimeters, which is uh, one-fifth of an inch, approximately less than one-fifth of an inch. And uh, based on my experience, when you see a contusion of this size, generally it's not a large contusion, even if a portion of it is not available for review. I want to go back now to the diagrams. We'll take this down for a moment. <coughs> and 
And doctor, I want to focus on this last line of the addendum opinion regarding Dr. Baden's, or, I'm sorry, excuse me, Dr. Golden's recollection of the location of the brain tissue with the contusion. Are you familiar with something called a coup, C-O-U-P type injury? Yes. What is that? It is the term used to describe a brain injury which is on the same side of a surface injury in the scalp or skull at the point where the skull or scalp injury is. Uh, that would be a cool type of injury that is in the same location underlying the scalp and skull injury. Now, given what Dr. Golden has uh, had transcribed in that paragraph as to his recollection, uh, and let me, uh, I'm sorry to put this back up so quickly, but just very briefly to go back to G, I'm sorry, B20, I believe it is, the scalp contusion. Yes. Now, if Dr. Golden's recollection is correct, that's, that's fine. If his recollection is correct that it's from the right parietal temporal region, where would that be in relationship to the contused area of the scalp seen in photograph B20 on the right side of the head? It would, the, it would be the same vicinity in the brain underlying this contusion. If that is an accurate recollection, and that means, therefore, that it is the uh, circumstance you've just described, would that have any bearing in forming an opinion as to whether a coup-type injury had occurred? That would, that would be consistent with that kind of diagnosis of coup-type injury to the brain. How is a coup-type injury inflicted that would leave a contusion to the scalp and a contusion to the brain? Uh, if, if, if you have a non-mobile head and if somebody strikes you on the head, you can have a contusion to the uh, scalp and the forces which causes the contusion to the scalp can cause the contusion to the brain also. And if that occurs by, you said, an immobile head? Yes. Meaning it's stationary? Yes. And uh, but it, you could also have a non-mobile head, but in, but it's more common with a non-mobile head. That is, non-moving head, non-moving head. That'll be a simpler term to use. I think we had two non-moving heads. I'm trying to clarify in my own mind. The way that this can occur, the most common way involves the head not moving at the time the head is struck in some fashion? Yes. And for example, it could be struck by a closed fist? Yes. Or by the rounded end of a knife? Yes. And when that occurs, then you can have injury that will be seen both to the scalp and to the underlying brain that is on the same side as the scalp injury. Yes, and the force should be considerable force. And is there another way that is a common way that a coup type injury can be inflicted? No, usually the coup injury is underlying the area of impact. And the area of impact could be a direct impact or, uh, uh, you know, the coup injury is always from a direct impact underlying the area of direct impact. All right, a direct impact to, in this case, the head? Head on the right side because the contusion, as Dr. Golden recollects, was on the right side of the brain. Now, doctor, are you familiar with something called a contra-coup type injury, C-O-U-N-T-R-E, actually, I think I got a U in there that's not uh, entitled to credit, C-O-N-T-R-E, C-O-U-P injury? Yes. And what is that kind of injury? That injury occurs in an area of the brain opposite the area of impact to the skull or the scalp. So using, uh, for example, the right side of the head B20 contusion as the area where there has been force applied, for example, by a closed fist or by the rounded end of a knife. If this were a contra coup injury, where on the brain, if anywhere, would you expect to see a contusion? In the hypothetical situation you, you just raised, wherein the right side of the head was struck by the uh, base of a knife or a fist, that will not cause a, that could cause a contra coup injury if the head was not mobile. 
and fixed. But then you'd also expect to see a coup injury associated with it. If the head had been pushed against a smooth surfaced object and the right side of the head had sustained this contusion, so you have, now the situation is a little different. You have a moving head which is, being, which is striking a fixed object, then you could have a contrico injury diametrically opposite to the area of initial impact on the other side of the brain, which would be the left side of the brain. So in the hypothetical that I raised initially, you could actually end up with both a coup type injury and a contra coup type injury? Assuming that this <coughs> direct impact with the base of the knife or the fist, as you postulated, occurred with a non-mobile head. Now, in the uh, third circumstance that you're indicating... And again, you must use considerable force when this injury occurred. What do you mean by considerable force? The <coughs> force was not just somebody hitting like this, but a good punch or a good... Uh, forcible striking of the head. Well, when you say considerable force and it wasn't like this, you took your fist, your left-handed fisted um, hand, and I'm not even sure if you even touched the side of your head. No, but I don't want to hurt myself. <laughs> I'm sure you don't, doctor. But can you give us some indication be, as to the degree of force that's required? Well, like a knockout punch. A knockout punch? Yes, which you see in the boxing matches when somebody hits and somebody gets knocked out. That is a good considerable force punch which has uh, caused, which will cause a coup and a contra coup type injury on a non-mobile head. Now to the third situation of a pure contra coup type injury, is the head moving? Yes, the head is moving, it strikes an area, and the brain opposite the area where the head has struck gets the contra coup injury. In your visits to the 875 Bundy location, did you find environmental source or sources against which a moving head of Nicole Brown Simpson could have been struck in the area of the right side of the head shown in B20 to create a contra coup injury that is with the scalp contusion seen on the right side but a brain contusion seen on the left side? Objection, no foundation. Sustained. Doctor, hypothetically, let me withdraw the question. First of all, were you able to find smooth type surfaces at the Bundy location which would be of a type that if a moving head were forced against such a surface, a contra coup injury could have been inflicted? Yes. Objection, no foundation, motion is straight. Oh. <coughs> oh, well. You may answer the question. Yes. What surface or surfaces did you examine that would be consistent with that? We, we had a side railing which had a rounded uh, end. We also had uh, evidence of uh, 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 side uh, railing uh, on the, next to the wall which has posts in it, metal posts. And if you have a photograph, I can show you the areas. All right, before I get to a photograph, uh, those types of surfaces would be consistent with creating a contra coup injury if the head of Nicole Brown Simpson had been forced against one or more of them? Yes, because but the reason I have to emphasize the smooth surface is the scalp contusion doesn't have any abrasion on it. It is a smooth, it was, uh, so it has to be a smooth surfaced area where the head impacted. And doctor, uh, in your examination of the uh, surfaces at 875 Bundy, did you examine railings and fences, metal fences, and the paint surface to look to see whether the surfaces were all smooth or there were rough uh, spots in any of the surfaces? Yes. Objection, no foundation. Oh, well. You may yes. ask. Yes. What were your findings? We had uh, evidence of a tree there with a with a rough bark surface. We had uh, some plants which had been pruned and we had stumps of uh, 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 stalks of the uh, stems of the plant still in place in the uh, ground. Doctor, I'm not sure that's responsive to my question because my question was dealing with the painted surfaces. Okay. Did, Did the emotion destroy? Yes, Joyce, to disregard the last answer. Thank you, Your Honor. 
the painted surfaces of any of the metal posts and so forth, did you examine those? Yes. And what were your findings with respect to smoothness versus roughness? Your Honor, again, there's no foundation as to when this examination took place. Co-rule. You may answer the question, Doctor. This was the painted surfaces of the railings and the gate and the uh, side uh, railing also. And what were your findings with respect to? There was uh, smooth areas. There was also some irregular areas. But there were smooth areas to the uh, metal railing. And irregular areas would be the same as rough areas? Yes. And if the head is forced against a rough area, what would you expect to see if something different than, for example, <laughs> the contusion identified in B20? You would expect to see ab an abrasion contusion. You would like, expect to see a scraping of the skin in addition to the bruising. And where within the contusion where would you expect to see the area of the abrasion? It would be on the area overlying the contusion. And you see no such area shown in the uh, scalp contusion identified in photograph B20? Yes. The only abrasion I see is the postmortem abrasion on the a portion of the bruise, which was from the shaving of the scalp. Can you show us what you mean by the uh, postmortem abrasion? It's right here on the upper part here, <coughs> a little bit because of the shaving. But the contusion itself doesn't. Uh, it's not an antemortem uh, abrasion. For the record, Your Honor, on photograph B20, Dr. Lakshmanan pointed to the. Um, top of the discoloration area uh, that's depicted. Thank you. And doctor, um, is it uh, a relatively common matter that when the head is shaved at the uh, coroner's office that such post-mortem after death abrasions can be created? I won't say common, but it does happen. And is it uh, something for which you are trained to be able to differentiate between a post-mortem abrasion from shaving from what was an abrasion inflicted while the person was alive? Yes. And on what basis do you differentiate in this photograph that uh, Be circumstance? Basically the appearance. What about the appearance? It's uh, very superficial and it's, it's, it's from uh, a shop, like a scalpel blade which has done it. Now doctor. And I used a magnifying glass when I did that examination. Doctor, mm -hmm. in the uh, circumstance of a coup injury, Dr. Golden's recollection then would place that brain injury that's seen in B33 under the scalp contusion seen in B20? In the same vicinity. Is there any way that you can distinguish whether this brain contusion was the product of a coup injury from a blow to an immobile head from either a fist or a rounded end of the knife, or a contra coup injury from the head in the area of the scalp contusion being forced against a smooth surface that was stationary. I can't. The fact that you cannot distinguish, the fact that you cannot distinguish whether this is a coup or a contra coup type injury that is the brain contusion, in your opinion, is that significant in your ability to answer any of the questions that have been posed to you? Objection. It calls for a conclusion. Oh, well. You may answer the question, Doctor. No. Why not? Because as I already mentioned, the fatal injuries to Ms. Brown Simpson where the stab wounds and the large slash wound to the neck, and this contusion occurred before that, so she was alive when this contusion occurred, so it has no significance as far as the cause of death goes, or describing or explaining the major injuries, explaining the bleeding pattern, explaining whether it's a single knife, a single edge knife or a double edge knife, I give an opinion on that. So really it's not affected the big picture. But it would affect your ability to give a more definitive opinion as to the exact <coughs> manner in which that brain contusion was inflicted. That is correct. I think we're done with, let's put it down for just a moment if I could. I think we're going to go back to the, uh, the blow-ups.
Doctor, I want to invite your attention to one of the um, other blow-up diagrams uh, from our 349 collection. In general terms, Doctor, would this diagram be useful to diagram any injury to the skull that may have been received? Not skull, scalp. All right, so this is a diagram that would be used solely for the scalp? Yes, but if there is any skull injury or a fracture, they could use the same diagram on the left side. On the right side, it's used to diagram the scalp injury. And I want to uh, talk, though, only about the left side. And on the left side, did, do you see any entry made by Dr. Golden to reflect an observation of any injury to the skull? No. Now, if Mr. Lynch could... Uh, and those last questions would be directed towards chart 20F. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. On the same poster board, but now 20G, and I think there were two 20Gs, so this is the one that uh, appears to have outlines of the neck and uh, top of the head. Doctor, is this a form that Dr. Golden can use at the time of autopsy to identify any injury to the skull should he find such an injury? Yes, on the lower part of the uh, uh, 20G, there's an area where you can diagram skull injury. And is there any entry reflecting such a finding? No. Now if we can flip one more. Now, Doctor, uh, a Form 20H, and again, I think there are two 20Hs, so this appears to be a diagram showing four different views of the human skull. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, is this a diagram that can be used by Dr. Golden to indicate any observed injury to the skull of Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. Do you find any entry made to reflect that there was any kind of um, sharp force injury resulting in uh, penetration of the skull? There's no record of any sharp force injury penetrating the skull, though a hemorrhage has been described underlying some injuries. And we're going to get to those in a little bit when we look at some other photographs. Is that the, your uh, reflection of your review? Yes. And if we, I'm not sure if there's one. Yes. And this is the second 20G, which appears to uh, show uh, a cutaway section of the human skull. Is that correct, Doctor? Yes. And what is, th is this a diagram that can also be used by Dr. Golden to reflect injuries observed to the skull of Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. Does this diagram, in fact, have an entry uh, in Dr. Golden's handwriting regarding his observations? Yes. What has he indicated? He has indicated no internal injuries. And what significance, if any, does that have to you? That he did not find any internal injuries, such as fractures, which may not be visible on the outside, because you could have what is called inner table fractures, and they are not seen either. So that's what he has indicated in this. What is the inner table? The skull has got two tables. You have the inner table and the outer table, and in between is what's called the diplo, D-I-P-L-O-E, part of the skull and where the uh, vascular channels of the skull traverse. So this is the inner part of the skull cap, and this is the base of the skull on the inside. So no internal injuries means no internal fractures of the inner table was documented. Doctor, if there had been uh, a portion of a knife blade which penetrated the skull and had broken off in the skull, would you expect Dr. Golden to have identified that on this form? You would have, if he had seen it, he would have identified it. Objection calls for speculation. He's already admitted to 30 minutes. Your Honor. Hold. Thank you. Your answer, I'm sorry, Doctor. If he had seen it, he would have documented it. I think we're done with this chart.
Doctor, is there anything else that you want to bring to our attention regarding your examination and observations of either the scalp contusion seen in B20 or the uh, contusion to the brain seen in B33? No. I'd like to move then to uh, the series of photographs that are to the left of the right side of the head B20 and look at photographs B23, B24, and B26. You want to do B23 first? Or? Let's start with B23. Doctor, what is shown in this particular photograph? There are two areas of sharp force injury seen on the back, mid back, and right side of the uh, head of Miss Simpson. The one which is on the uh, uh, right side of the back of the head is a linear sharp force injury which is three-eighths of an inch in length in my measurement of the uh, uh, one is to one photograph. And this is located about two and a quarter inches behind the right uh, ear canal, behind the right ear canal, two and a quarter inches, and three quarters of an inch above it. So it's somewhere two and a quarter inches behind and three quarters inches above this ear canal. This is the location of the injury, three-eighths of an inch in length. Doctor, can you again turn uh, to uh, indicate the left side of your head towards the jury? I mean, and the right side of my head. Is the right side. Okay. Then there's a label that's wrong. Yes. If the label says lower, middle, and left of back of head, the left is inaccurate? Yes. All right. Your Honor, we'll correct that for the record and have yeah. next recess. Thank you. All right, Doctor, then if you'll turn to the right. Would you point out the area uh, where this first sharp force injury you identified in B23 is? Somewhere here. And, Your Honor, uh, for the record, the witness has basically pointed in an area above and behind by several inches the top of his right ear. By several, how many? Five? Can I get a ruler? No, just it's tell me. It's about Three fourths of an inch above the right ear canal and two and a quarter inches behind the right ear canal in the nicole, so it's roughly in front corner. Right. Uh, That's a more accurate description. I agree. Doctor, if you could hold that that one, and is there any way you can show us simultaneously where the area of the scalp contusion was that we see in B20? Here. How about if you use my the sharp force injury, which I just described, is here, somewhere here, about three quarters, three quarters of an inch above the ear canal and two and a quarter inches behind the ear canal. The contusion I described in the scalp is here. And I think we described that contusion earlier, so I don't see any need for the record. Now, Doctor, the um, description that you've given of this uh, first sharp force injury in B23, and for the record, it appears to be the sharp force injury which is closest to the vertically oriented blue measuring card. Is that correct? Yes. It, are you able to determine whether this is an incised wound or a stab wound or what? This is an incised wound. And in your opinion, is this injury uh, a fatal wound? No, it's a non-fatal wound. In your opinion, would this injury have created any significant bleeding? It would have caused some bleeding, but not significant. In your opinion, does it play any significant role in the death no. of Nicole Brown Simpson? No. Are you able to determine from the appearance of that incised wound whether a single-edged knife could have inflicted it? It could have been a single-edged knife. Why? Because it's just an incised wound, and I already said that any sharp uh, instrument, either the single one edge of a knife can cause this incised wound. And based on what you've told us earlier and the schematics that we've gone through, 
can you eliminate the possibility that a double-edged knife could have caused such an incised wound? I cannot exclude that possibility. Doctor, are you able to determine if this is a wound inflicted before death, that is, an anti-mortem wound? It's an anti-mortem wound. How are you able to tell? Because of the uh, uh, hemorrhage in the tissues described in the report. And that's uh, Dr. Golden's report? Yes. Does he, in fact, in his original protocol, address this particular incised wound? Yes, he does. Does he diagram this particular incised wound anywhere in any of the available diagrams? He does. And is there any um, aspect of this incised wound addressed in the addendum? No. Is there, in your opinion, any reason why there should have been? Yes. Why? Because my measurement using the one to one photograph, it's a three-eighths of an inch in length, but the real measurement he has given, the measurement he has given is three-sixteenths of an inch. And why, in your opinion, does that require an entry in the addendum for this particular incised wound? No, since we addressed all the, uh, any errors in measurement or, uh, if there's any, since I found an error in the measurement, I thought if it had been measured correctly, it should be reflected in the addendum. In your Excuse opinion, me, Mr. Kelly, can we have the doctor keep his voice up, please? I'm going to sure. have a hard time hearing him. Sure. Doctor, in your opinion, was your measurement obtained by reviewing the life-size photographs one which was different from Dr. Golden's for reasons other than the limitations of the process of photographic measurement? Yes. And as such, is it your opinion that Dr. Golden made a mistake in measuring the dimensions of that wound? Yes. And as a result of feeling he made a mistake, you feel that if he looked at the photographs after the original autopsy protocol was prepared, that he should have addressed that error in his addendum? If he, has ha if he had looked at the one is to one photograph, yes. And doctor, in your opinion, are any or all of these mistakes of any significance in evaluating any of the issues you've reviewed? No. Why not? Because as I already told you, it doesn't affect the big picture of the cause of death, the uh, major wounds I described already, the bleeding pattern, or my ability to tell whether it's a single edge or a double edge knife. Whether his measurement is correct or your measurement is correct, the same single edge knife that you described as being consistent with causing all of the sharp force injuries could have caused this incised wound? Yes. While we're here, let's take care of uh, the second uh, sharp force injury that appears to the left in the photograph B23 of the one you've just described. Tell us about that one, please. This is a, a wound which is located in the mid-lower uh, uh, back of the head. And in my, measure, in my measurement, using the one to one photograph, I measured this wound to be uh, 5 eighths of an inch in length. and. Uh, I'm sorry, where, would, you, would, would you point to where you're, no, doctor, I want to, I want to focus, if we could, on this injury that's on the far left side. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, it's the same injury, which is better reflected on this photograph. Okay, let's make that clear first, then. Is B24 a close-up, if you will, of the injury which is seen on the left side of the photograph B23? Yes. Then let's focus on B24, if you feel that that's a better... Uh, depiction of the sharp force injury. The measurement you obtained is? Five-eighths of an inch. And if you'll show us slowly with the pointer in what direction that is obtained. The length was obtained in the one to one photograph from this forked end to this end here. So it measured five-eighths of an inch. The forked end was up to quarter inch in width. And this is the sharp end on the uh, left side of the Wound. So as one looks at the photograph, the forked end is to the right side of the photograph of the wound? Yes. And the sharp end is to the left side? Yes. And the 5 8 runs from the forked end to the sharp end? Yes. Now, doctor, is this a stab wound, an incised wound, or what? This is a fatal stab, uh, non-fatal stab incised wound. And on what basis? Do you have that opinion? Because uh, uh, 
the the depth and the 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 the, uh, the length on the wound surface is more like uh, uh, is longer than the depth, but the margin of the wound has some forking, so it could have been a kind of initial penetration component to the knife with either the movement of the head or the knife which created this uh, and turning of the knife which created this forking as well as the incision component to the wound. So if I understand correctly, initially there could have been a penetration of the scalp with the knife? Yes, but either the head was moving or the knife was moving on the scalp with some twisting to cause the forked appearance of the wound with the knife being drawn to uh, create this type of wound. Doctor, is that the uh, schematic number three that we saw in that chart that was up here yesterday afternoon? Yes. And given the depiction of a forked end and a sharp end, are you able to tell us whether a single-edged knife could have caused that particular sharp force injury? A single-edged knife could have caused it. And is it also fair to say that you cannot exclude from the appearance of the wound that a double-edged knife could have done so? That is correct. But is there any finding which in fact says that it was a double-edged knife and not a single-edged knife? No. Now, Doctor, I'm sorry, you wanted to add something? Yes. The depth was, I said, 3 8 inch to half an inch, and the length on the wound surface is 5 eighths of an inch. So, by definition, it should be an incised wound, but because of the appearance, we call it a stab slash incise because of the explanation I've already given you. Now, Doctor, why is this, in your opinion, a non-fatal sharp force injury? Because it would cause some bleeding, but not significant bleeding to result in death. In your opinion, is this also a wound that was received before death? Yes. So it's anti-mortem? Yes. Is there any way medically that you can determine how long prior to death, at a minimum, that that wound must have been inflicted? Before death? Uh, could be a few minutes before death. Can it be less than a few minutes? It could be. How few could it be? It's a sharp force injury which has hemorrhage in the tissues. If you look at the, uh, uh, the diagram we just saw earlier, you can see the hemorrhage underlying uh, I'm sorry, not underlying this one, the other one. This hemorrhage uh, could be as early as, as short as even as a minute before death. Now, Doctor, uh, is this uh, sharp force injury seen in both 23 and 24 addressed by Dr. Golden in his original protocol? Yes. Is it diagrammed anywhere in any of the original diagrams provided? Yes. Is it addressed in any fashion in Dr. Golden's addendum? Yes. Why was there a need, if you believe there was a need, to address it in the addendum? Uh, because in the diagram, he diagrammed it as a half an inch long wound, but in the original report, it was transcribed as a one and a half inch, uh, 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 one and a half inch long wound, and also the depth uh, was uh, given as a uh, uh, one and a half inches, and this had to be corrected in the addendum. Before we move to those uh, protocol pages, diagrams, and addendums, is there anything else, something I, I wanted to ask? Uh, from either of these two sharp force injuries in B23, are you able to determine whether the perpetrator held the knife in the right hand or the left hand? I can't say which hand the knife was held. With respect to either of those sharp force injuries? Yes. And is there anything about Dr. Golden's mistakes with respect to either of those two sharp force injuries that would have, had they not occurred, facilitated your ability to make that determination? Could you repeat your question? I'll try again. You have to keep your voice up, please, doctor. Assuming Dr. Golden hadn't made the mistakes you identified with respect to these two sharp force injuries, would you have been better able to determine whether the person held the knife in the right hand or the left hand when these two sharp force injuries were received? Even if he had di uh, accurately uh, depicted them, it would not have made any difference in my ability to opine what I've already opined. Is this simply one of the limitations of forensic pathology? Yes. 
Now, is there anything else you want to talk about with respect to the wounds themselves as seen in the photographs before we move to the uh, protocol diagrams and addendum? No. Zero B board and five B board. All right, from three forty nine. We're going to be taking our break at two fifteen. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, where in the original protocol does Doctor Golden address either the protocol, Doctor, not the diagrams? It's uh, uh, in. Uh, Keep your voice up, please. It's in page uh, number six. Doctor, where on this page, let's start with um, the uh, one on B23 that was more or less in the uh, uh, center of the photograph next to the vertically oriented measuring cart. Which, which one? Uh, you, want to look, you want to look at the photograph real quickly? B23 is this one, and we're talking about that. B23 is reflected in item 7. On page six. Your Honor, uh, with the red marker, I'll outline that. And Mark, this is only seen in B23, correct, Doctor? Yes. Uh, uh, this is seen only in B23, yes. All right. And um, according to this, the measurement was 3 sixteenths of an inch in length? Yes. And involved the skin only? Is your measurement of that different than the 316? Yes. What is your measurement from the life-size photograph? 3 eighths of an inch. Now, doctor, where, if at all, in the diagram or diagrams was that particular wound identified? Right here. And this is on 20F, and with the red band, well, and is there an entry for it? Yes. It says 316 inch wound, uh, paper, and this is a wound. Doctor, you've got to keep your voice up. Remember that the reporter is behind you, so it's difficult to hear you. Your Honor, where uh, Dr. Lakshmanan has uh, indicated with the pointer, I'm circling the area on Form 20F, and I'm writing B23 in red. Thank you. And I'm going to need another red marker. This one is deceased. Thank you. Um, Doctor, is this um, sharp force injury diagram anywhere else in any of the other diagrams? Yeah. Now, if we could then, uh, this is not addressed in the addendum, is that correct? No. That is not correct? It's not addressed in the addendum. But should have been? Yes. Given what you believe is an error? Well, if you have the opportunity to look at the one to one photographs and measure But. It's based ultimately on your belief that there was an error made in the measurement. That's correct. Mr. Kelberg, Mr. Doctor, perhaps you could allow each other to finish asking the question before you start to answer, Doctor. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I apologize, Your Honor. I'm just going to use the uh, marker with a little more ink in it and write in the 23 on Form 20F in a little clearer fashion. Doctor, let's go to the second. Uh, of the sharp force injury seen in B23, which is shown, as you said, in close-up on B24. Where is that addressed in the protocol? That's item number six here. All right, and I'll uh, mark, in, actually in blue, just to set it off a little better. And I'll write B24 and comma in B23. Now, Doctor, you mentioned something about 
how um, the measurement was reflected in the original protocol. Yes. Where is that within this paragraph six? The transversely oriented wound measures one and a half inches in length, and the depth of penetration is three eighths of an inch to one and a half inches. Is this wound diagram somewhere in any of the diagrams? Yes, in 20F. All right, and Doctor, perhaps Mr. Lynch can move to this side. This wound here, it's got the forking on the right side, and here's a description. It says transverse cutting, half an inch wound, and three eighth inch to half an inch deep. So he has diagrammed the measurement uh, uh, accurately. Uh, and the area, doctor, where you just outlined, I'm circling in blue. And I'll write again B24, B23. The measurement that is given on the diagram itself, the one half inch, and then the depth of three eighths to one half inch. Do those measurements correlate with your measurements? No, my, my measurements was actually five eighths of an inch in length and quarter inch uh, wide four. But given the limitation of the process, because you know it's a gaping, it's a gaping wound, I can't approximate it. So given the limitation of the process, this measurement is, uh, falls within our five parameters. So it's the limitation of the process. given that limitation, your measurements are consistent with what is diagram? Yes. Uh, there is a, from my measurement and his measurement, there is a one-eighth inch difference in the length. And That's it, fine. But I would attribute it to the limitation of the process because of the the gaping nature of the wound and the forking that you see. But your measurement and Dr. Golden's diagram description of the measurement differ from what is actually in the transcription of the description of the wound. That's correct. But he did correct that typographical error in the addendum. And let's look at that if we could. And, uh, is there any other diagram that has any reference to that second sharp force injury from B23? Uh, no, not for that one. All right. Let's, we'll put the addendum up and pull the diagram down. <laughs> Doctor, on this first page, do you see the reflection in the addendum of a correction for that sharp force injury uh, that's seen in both 23 and 24. Yes. Uh, for actually, the correction is for photograph 24. I mean, the wound for 23 and 24. It's number one, page six, line four, and line six. And where you uh, just point the doctor, I'll outline that in blue, and write page 24. B23. And in essence, do, I'm sorry, you want to add yeah. something, Doctor? And I said it can be attributed to limitation of process. This cannot be attributed to limitation of process because there is a one eighth inch difference. I, I will find a little different. It should be, it cannot be attributed to limitation of process. So there is a difference. We'll back up and make sure we have that clear. Let's start with this first of all. The addendum change is to change what the measurements were as transcribed on page six of the protocol yes. to the measurements that were written in on the form 20F that we saw just a moment ago. Yes. Now you say that your measurement in some fashion, which differs from a measurement of Dr. Golden's as he diagrammed it and as he has corrected the report to reflect, differs in a way that you believe cannot be attributed yes. to the limitation of the process? Yes. Explain. Because he has diagrammed the wound length to be half an inch. Excuse me, Doctor, could you turn just slightly because I don't think all the members of the jury can hear you. He has diagrammed the injury to be half an inch in length. In the gaping state of the photograph, in the one is to one photograph, I measured it to be five eighths of an inch, which is one eighth inch more in the gaping state, which I cannot attribute to uh, the limitation of the process of the gaping state. 
If you recall yesterday, we had uh, several photographs from a uh, forensic pathology text shown on the overhead, and we've had them made as exhibits that showed a gaping wound, and then it had been approximated. Do you recall those photographs, yes. Doctor? And when a gaping wound is approximated, what would you expect with respect to the length of the wound when approximated from the length of the wound in the gaping state? The length of the wound in the approximated state is longer than the uh, length of the wound in the gaping state. Have to keep your voice up, Doctor. The length of the wound in the approximated state is longer than the length of the wound in the gaping state. And Doctor, did you find from your measurement in the life-size photograph that in the gaping state, the length of the wound was greater than Dr. Golden has diagrammed and indicated in the addendum from an approximated state? Yes. And from the standpoint of forensic pathology, does that make any sense to you? Well, it's, it's a definitely a measurement error, but not as far as the appearance of the wound. It's a non-fatal wound. As far as the big picture goes, it doesn't have any major impact on the cause and manner of death. Doctor, is there any significance as to whether this wound is five-eighths of an inch, as you measured in the gaping state, or one-half inch, as measured in the approximated state, according to Dr. Golden, on any of these big uh, ticket questions? No. Why not? As I already mentioned, it's a non-fatal wound. I can, I, I, I've already discussed the major wounds where I've indicated the uh, cause of death. I've indicated the blood flow pattern. I've indicated whether it's a single edge knife or a double edge knife which caused those wounds. I've indicated in this wound, I can't tell whether it's a single edge or a double edge knife. So I met the requirements to give an opinion on this case. So this small difference in measurement doesn't impair my ability to give an opinion on this case. Is there anything else you want to add? And don't forget, if you'd speak to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, is there anything else you wish to add regarding these two sharp force injuries that we've talked about from photographs B23 and B24? No. Your Honor, I notice the time. Does the court wish to take a break now? Yes, let's do that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15-minute recess. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. We'll stand in recess until 2.30. But to play a videotape for the parties here. Can we have a videotape, please? This is during the doctor's testimony regarding the uh, autopsy of Nicole Brown Simpson. All right, I think we've made the point. Thank you. All right, fair warning. All right, let's have the jurors. of our jury panel. Dr. Laxmanen is again on the witness stand. Mr. Kelberg, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. And Your Honor, I have another uh, board of photographs. That I will ask to be marked 
People's 355. Doctor, again, with the court's permission, and I think we're going to start with these photos. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Lakshmanan, I want to um, begin the um, testimony of these photographs on Exhibit 355 by looking initially at the uh, photographs B30 and B29 that are in the lower um, series of photographs. Let, let's start with B30. What is shown in that photograph, Doctor? B30 shows the uh, left hand of Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson. Uh, you can identify all coroner's photographs by the blue card. It has the case number there. And it shows the palmar aspect or the ventral aspect of the left hand and also the portion of the forearm. And there are no injuries seen in the uh, 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 areas which has been photographed. Doctor, what kind of injuries, if any, in particular, would you as a forensic pathologist be looking for on the palmer surface or in the palmer area of the hand and fingers as shown in this photograph in a case involving sharp force injuries? You would expect to see defense wounds <coughs> like uh, cuts and uh, puncture wounds, uh, and that's what you look for, and that is why this photograph is taken to show there's no injuries to, seen to the palmar aspect of the left hand. How are defensive wounds created? They are created when the uh, victim uses the uh, hand uh, or palm of the hand to ward off any inflicting injury and doctor, are there common ways that forensic pathologists find victims of impending sharp force injury attack try to ward off such attack by use of the hands? You will usually see the cuts in the palm of the hands, you can see it in the wrists and forearms sometimes, and the back of the hands. With respect to the palms of the hands, how can those injuries be created? One, the victim could try to hold the knife and you would get uh, uh, injuries which would be consistent with it, or sometimes uh, when a thrust is attempted on the victim, the victim could hold up the hand to prevent the thrust hitting the a vital area, so the hand could get a puncture type stab wound. So it could be a variety of uh, uh, types of injuries you could see on the hand, depending what the victim try to do if the injury pattern allows a forensic pathologist to interpret it. Doctor, and on this left hand of Nicole Brown Simpson, the Palmer side, did you find any evidence whatsoever of defensive wounds? No. Was the absence of defensive wounds of any significance to you as a forensic pathologist? We only looked at the left hand. Yes, and I want to ask you with respect to the absence of defensive wounds that you say are not present, that is the absence of them, what significance, if any, does that have to you as a forensic pathologist? The absence of injuries to the left palmar hand shows that uh, she did not receive any such injuries to that part of the body. Uh, so, uh, so most likely she was either incapacitated or rapidly incapacitated and did not use the left upper extremity in that defense. And if incapacitated, not just didn't use, but incapable of using that area of the hand to ward off an attack? Yes. Now, Dr. Um, does Dr. Golden 
uh, in his report protocol address the absence of defensive wounds to the palmar surface of the left hand? Yes. And does he diagram in any fashion on any of the available diagrams the absence of such wounds? Uh, the diagrams are blank. There's no injury described on the diagram. Would you expect him to have a separate entry to reflect no defensive wounds noted? He has done that. And we'll see that on whichever is the appropriate diagram? Yes. Doctor, looking now on B29, what does that show? That shows uh, several uh, findings. There is a linear. We'll get the pointer. Mr. Lynch can. There is a 3 8 inch linear cut type uh, abrasion to the back of the left hand near the base of the left ring finger. There is a small punctate abrasion which measures 1 16th of an inch in the base of the left ring finger. There is another uh, 1 16th inch abrasion to the middle of the middle finger and there's also another small abrasion here to the base of the left middle finger. So the main injuries are three small abrasions and the small cut abrasion to the back of the left hand. Now, Doctor, in your uh, wound chart for Nicole Brown Simpson, which I believe is Exhibit 350, do you identify each of these injuries that you've just pointed out on this photograph B29? Yes. And do you do so under the description for photograph B29? Yes. Have you arbitrarily identified these injuries by sequential numbering? Yes, I have. And did you number them sequentially in the fashion in which you've just pointed them out? Yes. Now, doctor, starting with um, what you described <coughs> as the cut abrasion, which um, in looking at the photograph appears to be uh, about perhaps a half an inch or so below the uh, blue horizontally oriented measuring card, is that correct? Yes. What is a cut abrasion? Basically the... Uh, and keep uh, your voice up please, doctor. It's caused by a knife, but it could have been from the, uh, uh, the knife being drawn on the skin, wherein you have some scraping of the skin, but doesn't cause a clear cut, deep incision wound there. And is that something that can be caused by a single-edged knife such as you previously described? Yes. And is that caused by the sharp end, uh, the uh, edged, sharp-edged uh, side of the blade or the blunt end side of the blade or it, what? I would favor it being caused by a uh, blunt edge tip of the blade. Why? Because it's not caused a significant deep cut, it's just a superficial uh, linear cut type abrasion. Doctor, would you describe that cut abrasion as a defensive wound? Yes. Why? Because that part of the hand uh, was trying to ward off uh, a particular injury to the body, but only a portion of the knife struck the skin surface, so it was not, so it didn't uh, uh, leave a deeper cut. Can you, uh, using myself uh, as one participant and yourself as the other, indicate in some fashion how that type of injury can come to be inflicted? If you use my left hand to represent that of Nicole Brown Simpson and you play the role of the perpetrator holding a knife, how that can occur? Uh, if I'm trying to stab you in the neck and you try to ward your hand, your hand may not have come at the same time when I was when I was trying to inflict the injury in the neck, so only a portion of the blunt part could have struck the hand, that's one way. And this cut abrasion could also be caused by other mechanisms. What other mechanisms? Where, uh, uh, and Mr. Uh, let me ask that you repeat that in reverse, because oh, okay. I think the jurors in that end of the box were not able to see your demonstration. And I didn't try and describe it for the record, because I don't think I can do that very easily. But we'll try maybe better with this. All right, Doctor, you I, think, I think you're going to have to take a step that way because you're being shielded out by the diagram. Go ahead. One mechanism would be when the thrust is being attempted, the hand could be raised to 
block the stabbing of the avoiding area of the body by the victim. <coughs> and but the knife did not strike the entire portion of the hand, only the tip of the knife grazed the surface of the skin. And that would be a mechanism by which this cut operation could have taken place. And basically, Your Honor, for the record, I raised my uh, left hand so that the back of the hand is facing Dr. Lakshmanan, who is facing me. Dr. Lakshmanan raised his right hand and made a uh, thrusting motion in the direction of my left hand, as if to uh, have a knife being thrust towards me. In an overhand motion, yes. In an overhand motion, yes. That's one mechanism I said. But the other, there are many other possibilities. When the knife is being wielded against this particular victim, the hand could have been injured in a similar fashion, but not necessarily when this thrust to a particular area of the body took place. Can you explain in some fashion? When the hand is, when, when the victim is trying to protect herself from this assault, and the knife is being wielded, you could have a similar cut, but the knife did not uh, uh, cause a deep cut, but just a superficial cut. Now, so it could be two. One. Talk to this side. One way it could be that when the hand was right in front, but did not get the full cut. The other way is that the hand just got a portion of the knife injury uh, uh, causing a superficial cut. Doctor, from the uh, depiction of that cut abrasion in the photograph B29, is there any way that you as a trained forensic pathologist can provide more a more definitive answer as to the actual positions of the perpetrator and Nicole Brown Simpson at the time that cut abrasion was inflicted? No. Doctor, can you determine from your review of the photograph whether that cut abrasion was in fact inflicted while Nicole Brown Simpson was alive? Yes. How can you do so? Because of the appearance and the coloration and the description given in the report. Can you form an opinion as to how long from the infliction of that uh, cut abrasion at a minimum Nicole Brown Simpson must have had a uh, beating heart and blood pressure? Uh, this happened when she was alive, and you can get this injury as early as one minute before death. Doctor, uh, starting with that cut abrasion, did Dr. Golden address that cut abrasion in his original protocol? Yes, he did. Did he diagram it anywhere? Yes. And was it addressed at all in his addendum? Yes. No, no, it was not addressed in his addendum. Was there any need, in your opinion, for it to be addressed in his addendum? No. Why not? Because uh, he had addressed it properly in the original report. Now, the second wound that uh, you identified or injury, I believe you referred to as a punctate abrasion? Yes. And we had that term on our chart yesterday, but would you refresh our recollections regarding what is a punctate abrasion? Punctate abrasion is a very small localized area of this uh, scraping injury. And what, if any, causes uh, would be possible for this particular punctate abrasion that you have identified in photograph B29? It's a very non-specific uh, injury. Can you generalize as to the type of uh, mechanisms that can lead to such a punctate abrasion? The it's a blunt force trauma against a rough surface, but also, if I recall, she was wearing a ring in her finger at the crime scene photograph. If you can go back to the... You're going to have to keep your voice up, and we'll get the crime scene photograph out. Now, if you'll slide the board that's closer. I have a feeling the people that run that machine don't like to hear the sound of metal against that machine. Thank you. and ask if you see something, we invite your attention yes. to the photograph CS39. There's a ring in that same area and uh, uh, the abrasion, uh, uh, Keep your voice up, the abrasion is in the same region. So doing the altercation if the hand had hit any particular uh, uh, rough surface, you could get an abrasion in relationship to that area. Would you describe these stairs that you uh, visited in the, at the Bundy location as a rough surface? Yes. Or the walkway that is shown in a number of these photographs as a rough surface? Yes. Doctor, are you able 
able to determine whether or not that punctate abrasion was inflicted while Nicole Brown Simpson was alive? Yes. What's your opinion on that? She was alive. Why? Because of the appearance of the abrasion. And is it safe to say that neither the cut abrasion nor this punctate abrasion have any significance whatsoever on the cause of death for Nicole Brown Simpson? That is correct. Did Dr. Golden describe in his protocol the punctate abrasion that you have pointed out on photograph B29? Yes. Did Dr. Golden diagram that punctate abrasion? Uh, yes. And did he address it at all in his addendum? It was not addressed in his addendum because there was no necessity to. No necessity to? Yes. All right, doctor, and, and um, we're not marking on the photograph where these uh, injuries are, but uh, the punctate abrasion is on the left ring finger, is that correct? Yes. And it's closer to the hand than it is to the nail of that finger, is that correct? Yes. Now the third injury, would you point that one out again for us where it is, please, doctor? Back of the middle phalanx, or the middle of the middle finger. And doctor, um, would it be accurate to say that that injury can be seen, uh, it's in about the middle, if you look side to side of that finger, and it's a little bit closer to the nail than it is to the hand? Yes. What kind of injury is injury number three? Again, it's a non-specific blunt force injury. It's uh, scraping against a rough surface or a contact with a uh, focally elevated rough surface. Did Dr. Golden address this in the protocol? No. Did Dr. Golden diagram this no. in any of the diagrams? No. Did Dr. Golden address this in any of the in the addendum? No. In your opinion, doctor, is his failure to do each of those three things a mistake? Yes. Is there any significance on any of these big ticket questions for his mistakes, either singularly or all three together? None. Why not? Because it's a non-specific abrasion, and uh, it doesn't affect the big picture, uh, as I already alluded to earlier in my other injury descriptions. Are you able to tell from looking at this particular um, blunt force trauma the, the specific positions, or um, the rel even the relative positions, let me ask you that, the relative positions of Nicole Brown Simpson and the perpetrator at the time that injury was received? No. And if not the relative, then may we safely assume you cannot identify the specific positions that the two of them had at the time that injury was received? That is correct. Doctor, there was a fourth injury I believe you described? The proximal portion of the... Uh, uh, Keep your voice up, please. It's in the base of the right middle, let's say the left middle finger, and it's under a small operation there. And for the record, that appears to be very close to where the finger joins the hand. Is that correct? Yes. And doctor, uh, I'm sorry, that is an abrasion? Yes. And again, uh, are you able to identify the type of source or sources responsible for that? It's a non-specific uh, blunt force trauma. Received prior to death? Yes. Of any significance in any of the big picture questions? No. Was it addressed in the protocol? No. Was it diagrammed anywhere? No. Was it addressed in any of the addenda? No. All mistakes? Yes. Any significance to the mistakes? No. For all the same reasons? Yes. So we have two that are addressed and two that are not. Is that accurate? Yes. Let's take a quick look at the two that are addressed. All right, Mr. Calvary, we'll need to move that one board. Which one, Your Honor? The tall board. The tall one? Yes. Can we just put it back? And yes. Unfortunately, I think that's the only place that'll.
going to be 0B and 4B. Doctor, on the protocol, where do we find a description of injury number one? The protocol, doctor, not the diagram. It's on page uh, 7. And where on this page is that? It's on the uh, sixth paragraph. You see the cut? This right here, doctor? Yes. With a blue marker here on her, I'm circling that. And that is <coughs> photograph uh, B29, I believe it was. Yes. Okay, and I'll write B29 for that. While we're here, what about the injury number two? It's on uh, uh, paragraph number three. Five. Incidentally, I think I'll write uh, number one under the B29 that I just outlined. And the, I'm sorry, which paragraph, Dr.? The paragraph above that. Under left hand? Yes. And I'll uh, outline that in blue also. And I'll put a line for B29 connecting to both of the paragraphs, but I'll put out number two for the uh, top of the two paragraphs and a line connecting number one to the lower paragraph. Doctor, with respect to a diagram, is the uh, diagram that is reflective of those injuries, this form 23? Yes. Would you show us, please, where there is any entry regarding those two injuries? Here. Here. You have to keep your voice up, please, doctor. It's here on the back of the left hand and the back of the base of the left ring finger here. What has Dr. Golden uh, written with respect, if anything, with respect to uh, the first injury that you described? It's a uh, half 